Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Today, I am thrilled that our AVNI speaker is Darren Walker, leader of the Ford Foundation, a $13 billion international social justice philanthropy. He is a man with a staggering list of accomplishments, but he is really so much more than that. Darren is an anchor of our city as well as an anchor of our nation. He is someone who, with great firmness as well as great compassion, is able to bring us together challenge us and encourage us really to be our better selves. We at Abney have been incredibly fortunate to benefit from his insight and his direction firsthand. He co-chairs our Census 2020 Organizing and Action Committee and his wise and strategic counsel, his advice and his support over the past two years has really helped us build towards a fair count. And for those who have not filled out the census form, please do so. He is also a member of the Governor Cuomo's Reimagine New York Commission. He's chaired the New York City Mayoral Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments Markers. He served on the Independent Commission on New York City's Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, to name just a few. Darren grew up in Texas. He is the son of a single mother. He was a Head Start kid, recruited to the program's first preschool class in 1965. It was an opportunity that set him on his path, first to the University of Texas for both grad undergraduate and law school, and then to New York, where he's put down roots and become a pillar of our community, something we are incredibly fortunate that took place. His story is proof that programs that help raise people up, like Head Start and the Pell Grant he received, have the power to create unlimited possibilities, both for individuals and for our society at large. Before joining Ford, Darren was the vice president at the Rockefeller Foundation. He also is the CEO of Abyssinian Development Corporation. Now as president of, Ford, of the Ford Foundation, it is one of the world's largest foundations. Since taking the role in 2013, he has tackled inequity as his primary mission. He knew that to do more good and push for justice, he had to rethink philanthropy, embracing different ideas, different voices, and different models. His mission is more relevant than ever in the midst of a global pandemic that has disproportionately impacted Black and other communities of color. Darren has challenged us all to look at the structures that maintain privilege, that block social and economic mobility, and that help and to help advance the, cha the changes that create opportunity and, and advance a more fair and just society. In a time with so much tough and rough news for us, his faith in people, in our country, in our city, his belief that we can grow together and improve is truly inspiring. And I'm grateful he's here today to share his wisdom and experience. In recent weeks, we heard from our public advocate, Jemani Williams. Last week, we heard from Deputy Mayor Phil Thompson as part of our series on conversations with black leaders. I wanna thank Melvin Miller and Laura Calacruccio of Abney for conceiving and building this important series. And I look forward to what's ahead in that. As New Yorkers, we are on a journey together, one I believe will continue to lead to a better New York. I hope the insights and perspectives we're hearing and the conversations we're having will deepen our understanding of each other and the actions we must take to make our city more just, more fair, more equitable, and more anti-racist, and to do the right thing. Now, it's my privilege to introduce our moderator for today, Jennifer Jones Austin, the CEO and Executive Director of the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies. She's a leader in the fight against poverty. You guys know her, she is a rock star who throughout her career has empowered the disenfranchised and the marginalized. She has served also as the Senior Vice President of the United Way of New York, as Family Services and Coordinator for, the, for Mayor Bloomberg, as Deputy Commissioner for the NYC Administration for Children's Services at that time, and as Civil Rights Deputy Bureau Chief for Attorney General Elliot Spitzer. I'm proud to say she is also an Avenue Census Organizing and Action Committee member. We'll have to wrap up at 1.45 on the nose today, so without further ado, I will get off and pass this to Jennifer and Darren. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, Steve, I want to thank you, Steve and you and Abney for uh, providing me this moment. For me, it's a rock star moment, a moment that I get to spend some time conversing with Darren, with Darren Walker. Um, I'll let you in on a little secret. I am supposedly taking the day off, but when the invitation came from Abney, to spend a little time with Darren, I said, of course I'm doing it. <laughs> and Darren, you are the highlight of my day. You are probably the highlight of my week. Um, I think you know how much I appreciate, uh, admire, revere you. And this is just an opportunity for me um, to be reminded that there are other people who are in on this conversation, but to, to like, you know, me learn from you, 
learn more about you uh, and, 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 and learn more about kind of how we all can be showing up in this, this moment. We're all here right now for a reason, for a purpose and a reason. And so there are many of us who want to learn from you and that's what we're gonna do in this next little while. We're gonna talk about uh, you as a leader, your journey to leadership. We're gonna talk about um, how we all can show up in this moment of social change and what that can look like. And, uh, and that can be both from, you know, like thinking about it philanthropically to um, how we can serve our communities and serve organizations seeking to serve others. So I'm just going to jump right in. If that's okay with you. Uh, I want to begin uh, with you sharing with us your journey. And as um, I mentioned to you, I, uh, you know, we all can read your CV. Uh, we can go online and we can read Wikipedia. We could read all of the, the, the articles written about you, and there are many for many good reasons. Uh, but what I'm curious about is what really has made you who you are? I once heard uh, Congressman uh, uh, Elijah Cummings talk about the footnotes those experiences along the way. There's law school, there's undergrad, there's this job, that job. But what are those defining moments? that have poured into you to become the leader you are. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I, um, you and Stephen, the combination, I feel like, um, I believe it was in Richard the uh, Second. I love Shakespeare, but there was at one point where Richard says, um, my life reads much more interesting, far more interesting than it actually is. So uh, you and Stephen have been enormously generous and uh, as have all of the ABNY members, I am um, so uh, grateful to uh, ABNY for what it stands for. This is a city unlike any other in terms of the people committed to uh, the civic good and the private sector, especially. It's really impressive. Mm -hmm. And during these moments, uh, ABNY is more important than ever. Uh, you know, I, Jennifer, you and I are longtime friends, so I, I don't want... I, I'm interested in talking about me only to the extent that it is helpful to talk about the moment we're in and what it is for. Uh, I'm really not interested in talking about me qua me. Um, but I do think that uh, we all have those footnotes and, you know, growing up black, uh, poor, gay in a small town uh, in Texas, uh, there are absolutely imprints on uh, your life experience. And we all have those experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think of so many. I mean, when I was 13, I uh, had my first job as a busboy in a restaurant, and it taught me so much because when you are a busboy, as you know, you are the bottom rung. Uh, you and the dishwasher are uh, the least uh, status um, uh, employees, and you do everything from, you know, clean the toilets to um, bus tables. And one of the things that I learned from that experience was what it feels like to be truly marginalized uh, in, in a place and a space. Because your job as a busboy is to uh, walk around the perimeter of the room and be invisible while you are waiting on people who often extend to you no dignity or in any way recognize your humanity. And I, have taken experiences like that with me uh, on a journey because so much of what I uh, see in the world today and so much of what uh, I am so fortunate to be engaged in here at Ford is work to ensure that every person is extended dignity mm -hmm. and that the idea that we all possess humanity is something that is not fully understood uh, in our society today. And we have too many of those of us who have benefited from the system and the system which quite candidly, uh, I've lived with privilege and I've lived without privilege. And I will tell you there is a difference. And I will tell you that when you live with privilege, the winds are behind you. You literally have the tailwinds that just simply by showing up every day, your privilege is compounded. Just as 
you as a disadvantaged, lower income person have the tailwinds that are compounding your disadvantage. And we have in our society today, and this is why we have brought all of our focus to the issue of inequality at Ford, we have too much inequality. We have too little opportunity. And when I was a boy, even though I experienced racism, homophobia, all sorts of things that were barriers, I never once felt that my country wasn't cheering me on, mm. that there were not uh, behind me uh, a, a, a set of infrastructure supports that would propel me forward. Uh, if I were taught and played by the rules and did all mm -hmm. the things that uh, I was taught to do, today I don't feel that little black and brown boys and girls in small towns and housing projects, or for that matter, a lot of working class white people in this country yeah. feel that America is cheering them on. Yeah. They, feel, they feel as the survey, the Pew, the Gallup surveys tell us what they feel. What they feel according to those surveys increasingly is that our systems are rigged. They are rigged for elites, they are rigged for people like us who have been big winners. I have been a big winner in this, uh, th this economy, the kind of capitalism that we have today that is generating far too much inequality. And so the question today for those of us who have been, been big winners is not what are you going to give back, but it's what are you going to give up? Absolutely, absolutely. And at the New York Times piece, the opinion piece that you wrote, really speaks to this issue that um, for all of us who have benefited from uh, the opportunities that were presented us or that we just were born into, uh, we all have some privilege. Or I should say many of us who are privileged have, you know, have a role and a responsibility. It's not just a white, black thing. It's all of us in this moment. Um, you know, Stephen introduced you and talked about uh, your having benefited from Head Start. And what we are seeing increasingly, uh, Head Start has always been challenged through the years uh, and other, you know, support programs have been challenged, but they're being ever more challenged. People often want to look now and say, well, what is really the value add of these programs? And so many of us are fighting to make sure that these programs are maintained. Uh, would you, if someone asked you, I'm just going to ask you, uh, can someone, do you believe that it is as easy today, and you know, this builds on what you, the point you spoke to, as easy today for someone with uh, your, your childhood and your childhood experiences with respect to growing up, as you've noted, in the 1% uh, lowest income, do you think that a child in America today has the chances that you had to succeed and become, uh, you know, someone who's accomplished as much as you, not just on, but not just because of merit, but because of all of the opportunities presented, uh, you know, not looking at Head Start as a handout per se. Do you think that someone in your shoes today, a little boy in your shoes today, has the opportunities that you had in America? The answer is no, that's not my opinion, that's not anecdote, that's a fact. Mm -hmm. The data, uh, I think, supports this. The evidence is incontrovertible that a young person today, the likelihood of their being able to get on the mobility escalator has significantly declined. The sad reality is that if you want the American dream today, you should move to Canada because Canada is delivering more social mobility, uh, more opportunity for lower income people to move up in society. And that is a ringing indictment of the United States that today uh, we do not have that. I never once considered the cost of education as a barrier to my getting a college degree. I never once thought about that. 
Um, I, I, of course, knew that I didn't have the money, but I knew that there were pathways through the Pell Grant, through private scholarships, through work study, through the various mechanisms, and that it was all within reach. Today, that is just simply not the case. So when I graduated uh, and went to law school, came to New York, uh, I, I did that all debt free. And mm -hmm. so today, that same young person um, comes to New York with six figures of college debt or law school debt. And it significantly impedes uh, your ability to do the things that we should be doing. I was talking with my friend Robert Smith recently because in acknowledging the great thing that he did for Morehouse in mm -hmm. uh, that graduating class of 2019, the challenge- he, he played the, he paid off all of their loans. He paid off all of their loans. And, but what I was saying to Robert is I need him to also speak to why private philanthropy can't solve that problem. Mm -hmm. And it becomes sometimes a distraction when people say, you see, that's the solution. We just need uh, billionaires to adopt uh, a graduating class. Uh, that is not a systemic, uh, scalable solution mm -hmm. to what is a major public policy challenge. Right, and right. got to have the government engagement to ask the question, to set the parameters for what college ought to cost for uh, a low income, a moderate income um, um, student. Now, that's not to say that colleges need to be regulated in this way by government, but it is to say <laughs> that government and the public has a role to play in investing in human capital. My country believed in my potential. That was manifest in the Head Start program. That was manifest in the good public schools I attended. I'm proud to say, Jennifer, that I have never attended a day of private education in my life. And the places and spaces I occupy today, that is such a rarity. It is such a rarity to find anyone um, in many places <laughs> here at the Ford Foundation mm -hmm. and other places mm -hmm. where you say, have you ever attended any kind of private school? Almost everyone raises their hand. Um, and I believe that is a problem when we have disinvested so in the public, anything, public education, public parks, public housing. We have privatized uh, the idea of public goods and public assets Mm -hmm. And that's very dangerous in a democracy. So how do we begin to, to change this, this dynamic, this picture, this, the environment in which we now live? For so long, uh, you know, the response, the, the response of philanthropy has been kind of these one-off like projects or programs, but not really engaging in social impact work and maybe not really understanding that. Uh, and even sometimes not willing to engage in uh, the work that brings about change in policy. Uh, you, know, but, you know, sometimes people say, well, you, you've got philanthropy investing billions and billions and billions of dollars in aggregate and you don't see real change. But very often that's because we're investing in a little program here, a little program there, and we're not really looking for social impact. So, so what do you think in this moment? Um, businesses, individuals, uh, people already in the philanthropic space, in philanthropy, should be doing. Uh, should we be engaging more with government? Should we be engaging just with the big institutions? Like what, what should we be doing? So let me just take on one, th this, uh, this canard that I think I uh, hear, and that is we've, ne we've not made any progress. All billions, trillions have been expended and we've made no progress. So first of all, that's not true. Mm -hmm. There was a period in, uh, from the middle 1960s to uh, 1979 where we saw tremendous 
progress in terms of poverty alleviation, educational achievement and attainment. Um, we saw advances in the workplace, uh, the numbers of people uh, of, of people of color, uh, particularly African Americans, going into professional schools. Mm -hmm. We saw unprecedented progress. That progress began to level off and then reverse itself. And why do you think it was? Because, and, and well, I guess that's not, it's not why I think it was. It is what the data tells us. No, 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 no. What I'm saying to you is why do you think it leveled off? Because yes, what well, this I'm is saying, my point. I mean, right. I, I will tell you why I think it leveled off, but why I think it leveled off is because what the data tells us and me okay. are the reasons. The reasons are, one, we reduced our commitment to anti-poverty. Mm -hmm. We uh, experienced the backlash to affirmative action mm -hmm. and the pernicious idea of reverse discrimination. And so we had the Baki case and other cases that sought to uh, reduce uh, our country's commitment to uh, taking affirmative steps to bring in uh, previously excluded populations, particularly African-Americans, we saw an assault on that. So, and we saw corresponding reductions. Concurrently, we saw the implementation of the war on drugs, mm -hmm. which desecrated our communities and criminalized Black men and women Indeed. and large numbers. Uh, and we saw a change in the corporate structure of our economy, which moved from what had been a more of a stakeholder capitalism idea to this Friedman, Milton Friedman idea of the role of the corporation is to earn returns for its shareholders. Right. That's the role of a company. All of this together mm -hmm. set us on this course that resulted uh, 30, 40 years later in uh, mass incarceration of black and brown bodies uh, in the uh, assault on the idea of government, uh, just the notion that government has a role to play. Uh, there has been a, uh, an effect uh, and a very effective effort to undermine that very idea. Uh, and we have seen the growing inequality in our system uh, and that economic inequality, which results from, uh, and again, I think the, uh, I am a capitalist, but I believe the kind of capitalism we have today is mm -hmm. actually harming our democracy. Indeed. And part of that harm has been this, this sort of Friedman idea. Um, and, and that is what did away with many of the mechanisms for, uh, for equality. So mm -hmm. my grandfather had a third grade education and was semi-literate, but he worked as a porter and a shoeshine man at an oil company in Houston. As a part of his compensation, he had an old fashioned profit sharing plan and he got the stock of that company, which is today Anadarka uh, Oil Company, but he got that stock and when he retired, his social security check and that stock gave him a life of comfort. They traveled, they went to Disneyland, they <laughs> saw their relatives who moved out to LA, they did all the things that uh, middle-class Americans dream of doing. But that has ended today. So we have an economy that says, if you give to workers, shame mm -hmm. on you. And we saw that Several years ago, the chairman of Delta Airlines uh, announced that he, after a banner record year, was sharing profits with workers. Yeah, I remember. And he was roundly assaulted by the analysts uh, in the airline industry who, uh, the, the coverage of the airline industry analysts, who said, those dollars don't belong to them. They belong to the shareholders. And we're going to ding your stock because you shouldn't be giving that money to the workers. So we've had all of these things working concurrently that bring us to this place we are today, which right. in order to change, we must have leadership. We must have leadership in Washington and leadership uh, at the helm of uh, our corporations, both our public companies and importantly, what 
is off the grid that policymakers don't even fully get, which is we have fewer public companies today than we had five years ago and mm -hmm. fewer then than we had 10 years ago. And that is because companies can get money in the private capital markets. They don't need to go public necessarily. So we have fewer companies. So what has happened in this last 20 years has been the burgeoning growth of private equity and privately held companies, which today employ millions of people. And in fact, we, the Russell 3000 index doesn't even have 3000 companies anymore in it because of the growth of private uh, sector, uh, sorry, of private equity and privately held companies. So the whole thing needs to be taken on and um, it's gonna take real leadership to make that happen. Jennifer, I think right. we need to get you in charge. You see, if we had <laughs> you in charge, I think a lot of these problems would be, would be taken care of. You know, uh, I, and I love you for that. I love you for that. I think that you know, one of our biggest challenges in this moment is that people don't know the history. And so they look to the last five, 10, 15 years and they look to, uh, you know, they look to like the, the, um, the high uh, incarceration of black persons. Mm -hmm. They look to, you know, what is the current uh, achievement gap? of black and brown children. And they say, see, these programs don't work. They don't mean anything. And, and, and that serves the narrative that then allows them to continue down this path of disinvestment and disengagement. Um, you know, one of the things that I appreciate about you, uh, uh, Darren, is that, you know, I, I feel like you bring your whole self to everything that you do, that your professional is your personal and, and, and your personal is your professional. And that allows you to see what is happening in this world and how we all have to be a part of the change. So as organizations, businesses, um, nonprofit, uh, you know, and, and, and for-profit businesses are thinking about how they show up in this moment. Yeah, I'm going to ask you, what do you think are, um, what are the opportunities and what are the dangers? Yeah, one of the things that I'm concerned about right now is everybody's now saying, you know, Black Lives Matter. And there, you know, the banner goes across the, you know, the, the front of the website page. And that suggests that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm on board and, you know, we're good to go. Or let's go find an additional few, you know, persons of color to populate our board with, and we've done what we need to do. What does real social change look like right now for corporations and even for those in the public sector and in the not-for-profit sector? So we're seeing, you know, unprecedented uh, engagement on this issue as a result of the murder of George Floyd and Ahmaud Aubrey and Breonna Taylor and mm -hmm. so many others. Because uh, after the murder of George Floyd, I think it became clear that racism was no longer deniable. Deniability was no longer an option for white Americans in the wake of that murder. And it allowed for the first time uh, a kind of a collective acknowledgement of a reality that many uh, folks of color have lived um, for over 400 years in this country. And I see today sort of two things happening. On the one hand, you're right, Jennifer, there is a tremendous amount of virtue signaling, of guilt grants, of issuances of platitudes about uh, Black Lives Matter and the crisis communication staff have come up with amazing words and language and allegorical imagery in your commercials, et cetera. And then separately, I am seeing leaders make uh, fundamental transformational uh, announcements and commitments. Uh, and this is what we need. We need to move beyond the kind of tokenism that has been acceptable to a real conversation about transformation. And, and we have to do this in the spirit of helping us all unite and heal. Uh, we can be better than where we are today. Uh, I grieve for my country today. Uh, I grieve because 
it is, it is uh, not the America uh, I want. And I want to believe uh, as, uh, as Langston Hughes believed mm -hmm. in the great poem when he says, let America be America again. America never was America to me. But he goes on to say, and yet one day America will be. Because he had faith that even in spite of seeing the ugly underbelly of racism that he experienced as a Black man, he believed in America. And I think that for so many of us, and John Lewis, of course, is my hero in this regard. You have to carry with you that rage and that optimism and that belief in this country. And we're seeing actions by leaders that give us reasons for hope. And much of that is coming from the private sector, quite candidly. It is coming from CEOs and boardrooms who are waking up and literally hearing for the first time their Black employees tell them the stories of mm -hmm. the racism they experience between getting in their car and driving to the office, the fears they have of just being stopped by law enforcement. And also, they are listening to the narratives of racism that actually happens at the workplace. And I think for a lot of CEOs, this has been uh, an incredibly uh, challenging period because they are hearing things uh, for the first time that they, they may have heard, but they are listening in a different way. And so I'm actually encouraged. I'm not saying that you know, corporate America is going to transform itself overnight. That's not going to happen. But I do believe that we are seeing reasons for hope and exemplars of the way in which a path forward can be forged that will get us to a, a better day, a better, more, uh, more shared prosperity kind of economy that makes it possible to believe again. And, and um, do you believe that, um, that, 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 that this, this moment is different and that the door is not going to close overnight? Um, you know, there's a lot that we're asking that we are desirous of uh, with respect to change in our, in our, in our, in, in corporations, in businesses. Uh, for me, even in the nonprofit sector, I believe that we need to see some change. And I, I say all the time that just because organizations are serving individuals, children, and families doesn't mean that there isn't systemic racism and, and bias that is ever present in their services and how they engage with staff. Um, how do we ensure in this moment that the door doesn't close? Overnight, I mean, one of my biggest, and I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an eternal optimist, I believe in this moment, I believe in showing up to be all that we can be in this moment, because we're here, we're purposed to be here at this moment, to lead and to serve, you know, but I, I get anxious when I see, um, and I hear people talking about systemic racism, and limiting it to police misconduct, police brutality, excessive use of force, when systemic racism is present in just about every pillar of our society. How do we ensure against the door closing too quickly? Well, I think the door is uh, not going to close quickly okay. because of several reasons. One, within corporations, we have something we did not have 10 or 20 years ago. We have large numbers of African-American employees who are often organized. They're not organized necessarily at like a union, but they're organized in employee resource groups in various affinity groups. Mm -hmm. And these groups are demanding accountability. And I've heard white CEOs say, I've never felt this kind of pressure from my black employees, for example. Um, so that's uh, changed. Uh, we, the external um, customer, consumer, client base is changing and they are demanding as well 
accountability around these mm -hmm. matters. Uh, the gatekeepers have changed. And Jennifer, in certainly in the space that you and I occupy, um, when was there ever a time when four of the top 10 foundations in America were headed by African-Americans? Indeed. When was there ever a time that we, where we saw the leadership of so many of these institutions changing to be mm -hmm. led by people of color. And so I believe the gatekeepers, whether they be uh, at foundations, uh, in the nonprofit sector, in media, when was the last time there was a black man as executive editor of the New York Times? Mm -hmm. It should not come yeah. as a surprise that the Times' uh, journalism right. has embraced this moment this and is, is asking and is giving light to these issues of systemic racism in both its editorial page and the journalism that it covers. So I think that we are not going back. Uh, the gatekeepers, whether it's me and Elizabeth Alexander at Mellon who are deciding uh, the parameters of who gets grants uh, mm -hmm. to uh, the people in government who are saying these are the organizations who we should be investing uh, our government pension funds uh, in, um, et cetera, et cetera. Too much has changed to go back. And I actually don't think we want to go back, most yeah. of us. I think, and I don't think, and then to be really explicit, I don't think most white people want to go back. I think most white people are troubled by the idea. They don't want to live in a racist America. Mm -hmm. And so I think the work that we have to do is together be on that journey. And we have to give space. Uh, and um, uh, the, the, the time and, and, the, and, and the opportunity to make mistakes uh -huh. to our white yeah. brothers and sisters who want to be on the journey with us but out of, um, out of naivete. I mean, you knew my dear David, my partner of 26 years, who was, when I met him, just, you know, a nice, um, you know, 30-year-old, you know, guy from Chappaqua, New York, who had never actually engaged with Black people. And his just naivete right. and ignorance and um, in no way intentional but some of the things he used to say when we were first going out in no way were intentional. They were just ignorant. They were just right. uninformed. And right. I can imagine that today, if he were to be, you know, uh, be videotaped saying some of those things that were just clueless, he could be called a racist. And what a shame that was. But he was trying. Was. But, he was, but he, was trying. he was trying. Oh, he was on the journey. I mean, look, he right. was, <laughs> he was, you know, in love with a black man, uh, right. much to the horror of a whole lot of people. <laughs> and um, obviously he was on the journey, but he was not informed on that journey. He was not even prepared to be on right. the journey. You know, I he, had a, was, he wanted to be on the journey. Right, I had a conversation. Uh, uh, I, I'm a part of a book club now titled The Uncomfortable Book Club Discussion. And it is um, a group of about 20 women, uh, the majority, the great majority of which are, uh, are, are persons who are white. And uh, our first book is White Fragility. And uh, one of the organizers of the book club, a woman who is white, opened up with, I just realized after George Floyd, it is my turn to give back. And it was like, you know, okay, but we got to give back. It's not giving back. It's being that's a right. part of the solution, right? And, and so I think that that's, you know, people, they may not say exactly, they may not express it the way that they intend it. And right now in this moment, people do want to be a part of this very necessary, this very critical solution. Um, when you are making grants uh, to institutions, do you look at their, um, you know, their board uh, and look at the Absolutely. Others. Just to be really clear, we have, uh, with every invitation for a, a proposal, and if we get an interesting proposal, or, and we then invite you to submit a full proposal, in that uh, email package that you get from us is our diversity um, 
table. And we want to know um, both, you know, the people of color, um, disability, and, and uh, other um, diversity uh, characteristics of your organization, the board, um, and it's material uh, to whether you get a grant from the Ford Foundation. We take um, a racial equity lens to much of our work. Um, and, and because of that, it leads us to more likely fund organizations that are uh, led by, uh, have significant representation on their boards and staff, people of color. That's not to say that we uh, don't fund um, uh, uh, majority white organizations, uh, we absolutely do. But often, even in those cases, uh, we are interested in their diversity work. We're, we're interested in helping them uh, to become more inclusive organizations. But it is very important because when we have done this and other foundations are also doing it. So this is the way when I was referencing gatekeepers and how gatekeepers mm -hmm. can change systems Mm -hmm. um, and our and recognizing our influence, if we I know that if the Ford Foundation implements a policy, uh, other foundations may or may not do it, but they will certainly uh, um, want to know about it, and many of them will ultimately make those changes. And you know, and I think we've only got two minutes left, unfortunately. But I, I do want for those who don't know to know that you've been advancing this change. Uh, for for decades now, and just speaking about the Ford Foundation, I, I remember several years ago when you determined to sell off uh, the art collection of the Ford Foundation and to reimagine uh, the art, uh, you know, the art collection for for the for the foundation. There were a lot of people whose you know eyes wide and larger than mine, like, "What are you doing?" But you had a you had an objective, you had an aim, and you wanted to evidence the importance of you know like inclusion and diversity. Well, and the diversity of our, I mean, we had a wonderful collection that mm -hmm. Henry Ford II had acquired, uh, a very typical 1960s uh, kind of a collection, um, all male, one woman, uh, mm -hmm. mostly European artists. Um, so we had a lot of drawings uh, of Picasso, uh, Chagall, uh, Renoir, um, I mean, we had a lot of that, uh, mm -hmm. wonderful things, but the trustees uh, decided um, that the vision that I put forward for transformation of the foundation around social justice, uh, inequality, um, and, and inclusion of, uh, of all of us in the narrative um, precluded uh, um, the idea of, a, of, a, of such an art collection. And so I was very excited that the trustees agreed with my recommendation to deaccession the collection and to take the proceeds of that sale and acquire uh, new works. And uh, I'm thrilled about the works we've acquired, the first of which is a monumental piece in our lobby by the artist Kahindi Wiley, who did the great portrait of President Obama of course, we could never afford a Kehinde Wiley today. We were lucky that uh, we, we got ours before um, the uh, Obama announcement was made because that was a game changer. But it's a great uh, indicator. But we've got artists from uh, Carrie Mae Weems and Kara Walker and mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Ligon. I mean, I could just go on and on. Um, just a terrific uh, array of artists, um, primarily artists of color, um, queer artists, um, artists uh, from... Uh, native country, um, and of course, international, uh, given that we um, are a foundation with offices in 10 regions outside of the U.S., to have artists from all of those uh, regions represented as well was very important because we see here this intersection of art and justice. We know that art has a role to play in, in a human being's development mm -hmm. of our capacity for humanity, our capacity to see the humanity in others, because we are more empathetic through uh, art. We, we become uh, more empathetic by engaging in poetry and, and the visual arts and the performing arts and theater. And when I see leaders, when I see people today who use language calling other human beings 
names that dehumanize their own humanity, that seek to uh, strip them of their dignity. Um, I look at those people and I know that they have never yeah. read Kipling. Yes. They have never seen a beautiful painting. They have never seen the photography mm. of Dawood Bay. Mm. Uh, mm. They have never uh, witnessed uh, Anna Devere Smith on stage. Uh, that these are people who themselves are suffering from a poverty mm. of intellect and a poverty of, of soul because their souls have not been nourished or nurtured by the arts. Because when your soul is nourished and nurtured by the arts, you see humanity all around you and you have an ability to empathize with those other human beings, whatever color they may be, whatever their status may be, because we're all humans. Yes. And each and every one of us deserves to live with dignity. Well, we're at the end of our time, but um, and that, that may be my greatest disappointment of the, of the week. You were the biggest highlight in being at the end of our time. Oh, it is my joy. Always did it for Jones oh. Austin. You know how much I love you and I could, I'll you go anywhere with know. you. <laughs> I love you. And you've managed uh, in just a little more than 40 minutes to cause others, I'm sure, to just be totally uh, enamored with you and all that you are and how you are showing up in this world and seeking to change the world, not just for some of us, but for all of us and never leaving behind uh, those who some consider the least of us. Not in the least, but we appreciate you. And I thank Abney for allowing us this moment. Yay, thank you, Stephen Rubenstein and <laughs> Abney and Melva. Thank you guys. You guys are incredible. I can't, I'm so grateful you said we're not going back. You said we're on a journey. And I just want to thank you both for leading us on this journey. And hopefully, I, I know you both will continue to lead us. And we're truly grateful. I just want to say, everybody, take care. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>